Hello again, back with more GPT chat content or just generally AI content. Uh, I'm going to watch a, oh well, a bit of the Joe Rogan show, uh, which it's, I don't, don't even think it's a recent one. It might be a few months old. So uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get started. The Joe Rogan experience. Goes without saying, everyone should watch all these clips and then the whole thing if you've got access to as well. It's a great podcast. But I want to talk about... Uh chat gpt mm. fascinating question have yeah you, have you experimented with it at all? i have not but yeah um this is <laughs> joe i'm disappointed with you you're now gonna admittedly talk something interesting about ai but it's like come on you can at least try it or get someone to try it you can watch you can't you can't fly blind on this one but someone uh the the gentleman who runs the uh, jre companion page um made a, a rap with chat gpt like uh was it was it if kanye west wrote a rap for chat gpt they put it on instagram but it's it, it's like it seems like a person saying it well joe that's because it was effectively written by people with people in mind by the creators and what the ai has done is looked at all the human data and the thing it's constructed is based off of that human data. So obviously it doesn't have any non-human data to use. So of course everything it comes out with is styled like it was written by a human. It's almost like if I showed you 15 pictures of a UFO and said these are all pictures of a UFO, then I asked you to draw one, you would draw one that looked like the 15 I'd just shown you if you'd never seen one before. So that's effectively what's happening there. But um, let's jo let Joe carry on. Like, you want to try it? No. Okay. <laughs> we could try anything you want. I mean, it takes a long time. He, really. he His thing took like 48 minutes to do. Well, whatever you want to look up right now, we can do it. Yeah, the problem is you have to cajole it. Well, you have to request it do something. It's, you know, it's an autonomous simulated consciousness. It isn't real. It isn't, this, it isn't really sentient. It isn't really conscious. It's like um, a pachinko machine. It can give you a random result. But it has to use physics to do that. The ball has to be dropped in for it. It can't put the ball in itself. Well, you could build one that did, but you get the general idea. It's not completely autonomous. So, uh, yeah, keep that in mind. It'll get something wrong and you have but to say no, not that But let's just explain what way. it is. So ChatGPT is a large language model trained artificial intelligence which is let's just say it can be awful but it is often surprisingly good at answering questions you might have about how to do things one of the great triumphs of it is that coders are now asking it to solve coding problems and it will actually write code that is functional it... i think we need to make the distinction here though that it's a language model it was written to do that purpose before it was written to do anything else it was written to complete bits of language code if you think about it that's why it's called a language model it wasn't primarily based off english because at first people probably didn't think it could handle such a complex language as english something like programming is a very simple thing to learn really if you've got a lot of time on your hands you can basically learn how to be a crummy programmer fairly quickly you know you can learn all the commands you can learn how to do X, Y, Z, simple things, move graphics, use a controller, type things, you know, print, all that kind of stuff. But that's not the difficult bit. The difficult bit is conceptualizing a machine where all the parts work together correctly and efficiently. So that's the thing that the AI is going to have to get good at. The rest of it's been done for a while. But anyway, let's continue. It's pretty amazing. And it also, there's a an implementation of it that if you feed it, up to three tweets it will write a new york times story in one of five genres you know <laughs> have you ever read the new york times it's not the best uh, quality of writing anyway so i think you know that's probably true it sounds a bit like sensationalized but it's like no the ai can probably write articles on a level with the kind of stuff that you'll find in there but it is not great again it takes a good writer to put the pieces of an article in the correct order and you know just write it in a way that a humans gonna relate to it so if the AI is doing that well again it's doing it because of the humans at the moment optimistic pessimistic neutral and 
um, you know, it's you don't really need the New York Times anymore because it's pretty good at this job, right? So on the one hand, it's all very interesting that we're living in an era in which there is at least, I mean, you know, and this is a prototype, right? This is a prototype that was specifically trained and then placed on the Internet so people could play with it, and I've seen lots of interesting um, uses. It's going to get better, right? We're dealing with ChatGPT3. There's going to be a ChatGPT4, which is going to Not sure Weinstein's well-versed in technology, in particular software. Um, iterative versions of software, like a 1 and then a 1.1, it's not a completely new thing. What that means is they've just expanded upon it and, uh, you know, going backwards, they've improved it. They've removed bugs and such. So GPT-3 and GPT-3.5, it's still the same thing as GPT-1 and GPT-2. It's just when GPT-1 was written, it only did one thing and it was not nearly as complex and the data set that it was attached to wasn't as large. So obviously they've trained it that much now. It's at something like 85 gig... Uh, something gigabytes or terabytes it's one of the two 85 something million something and that's the size of the data that it's got now so it's still the same thing it's just better and wiser and attached to more data it's going to be that much better because it will be built with the uh, improvements that have been gained through turning this one loose on the world but i have to say i am quite alarmed not only that this thing exists, but I don't think we're ready for it. Well, speak for yourself there. I'm not saying that everyone's ready for it. I'm not saying that as a species we should be trusted with something this powerful. I'm not saying that at all. But I don't think we should approach it with such trepidation that we're too scared to use it. I mean, ultimately, this is like... Um, when the chainsaw was invented, I suppose, or something like that, where it's got destructive potential, like anything has, and because it's new, you feel alarmed. You know, you're naturally, anything new is going to be alarming. So let's not confuse the alarm that something new produces naturally, genetically, biologically, with the actual alarm that I think uh, Weinstein is referring to here, where it's like an actual fear of something happening. So you're kind of thinking forward, ooh, I don't know what will happen with this rather than just looking at something and thinking, oh, I've not seen one of those before, because that's a completely different thing. And I don't think we're ready for it in a couple different ways. I mean, if you want to comfort yourself and say, well, this isn't that serious that we have this AI that can do these really shocking things, the, the comforting thing is that the way it's programmed, it doesn't know what it's saying. It doesn't matter that it convinces you that it's saying something and it means it and you know, that it seems like a creative entity. What it's doing is it is basically using a predictive model that has been trained on a huge data set of written language, right? So the answer is, if, you know, you take three words in a row, can you predict what the next word is going to be? And they've allowed it, they've exposed it to a large data set, and it's gotten really good at predicting basically these sequences to the point I feel like you should quantify that a bit more. I know he's not going to know that much about technology. The way that the AI does the data sorting and produces these uh, human-like responses, it's kind of like, you know on your phone when you're, you're typing out and you've got predictive spelling. So you've got your touch screen and you type in like C-A-N and it tries to complete the rest of the word or it gives you a selection of words that it could possibly be and then you, as you type more, it knows or you can just select the one that you want. So that's what it's doing. It's taking the data that's there and cross-referencing it with lots of previous examples and then trying to sort of predict what, what the rest of it is. But it's, it's not like trying to read your mind or anything like that. It's predicting it based on previous experience stuff that is remembered. Point that it can now, if you prompt it correctly, it can spit out these uh, uh, very long ex explanations. Some of them are dead wrong. Sometimes they're right on target. But I have two concerns about it. One, if you imagine that this thing just gets a little better than it is, which is inevitable, that it's going to make um, actual insight that much harder to spot, right? In other words, if you become expert at operating this thing, at querying it, and it becomes better at understanding a wider range of topics because they turn it loose on everything that's written on the internet, for example, right? 
then the point is the ability to fake expertise is going to go through the roof. But that happens anyway on a human level. So, and I think humans, if, hu if we're talking about the ability to trick money out of people or trick opinions into people, then humans are currently way better at doing that than an AI. I think the problem is that the AI is doing it well enough that not particularly bright or, you know, particularly young or naive people could be caught off guard with it once or twice, maybe. And uh, the lower intelligence people are very susceptible to it. But I mean, like I say, it's not as dangerous as a human who's good. It's just easier to use. And, you know, presumably these not so clever people could u use it against other not so clever people. So disastrous results would definitely ensue. But like I say, it's... Uh, that's not a problem with the AI, that's a problem with humanity. I don't think we know how we're going to police a world in which, I mean, this, is, this problem's already bad enough. Most academics are fakers. They don't know that, right? They trained in something, they wrote a dissertation, they think they're experts, but you can see when something unexpected happens, like the pandemic, you get just broad-scale failure across entire disciplines where nobody seems to get it right. Again, though, I think that's more an organizational failure of our society. It's like I did a video about why, um, how we live is completely unsustainable, and it's completely an organizational failure. It's like when Bill Gates is saying that we need to depopulate, or he didn't actually say that, when he's saying that the, the, the resources of the world are finite, so there's a maximum level of people that we should have in order that everyone can have enough resources to, you know, fruitfully live and not deplete what's there, um, you know, so that that number of people has to lower or the wealth level of the people has to lower. So um, as soon as we can organize ourselves better, that won't be a problem. Again, you can't really blame that on the AI. Right. So in that world, this is going to be even worse because now you have some an artificial intelligence able to generate things in plain English that are often full of true information, but you don't know whether what generated it is some, you know, brain dead model or something else. That's one concern. And then the other concern is when we say, well, ChatGPT doesn't know what it's saying. It's not conscious. We know it's not conscious because it's not programmed to have a consciousness. But you should know what it's saying because you're the one that engineered the prompt that it's responding to. So this is what I was saying earlier about the lack of technical knowledge is, is impeding your understanding. And, and uh, you know, you're, you're having to kind of assume a lot here, Mr. Weinstein, which I, I've got to say, I really like Brett in a lot of ways. And a lot of the stuff he says is, is on point, even though we don't agree everywhere. But on this occasion, I have to add him to the list of people who have jumped the gun here. It's like, just learn a bit about AI, go and use it and learn about how it works. And all this stuff will, will dissipate. And you'll realize that there are problems and there are fears that you should have with it, but not, not any of the stuff you've said so far, unfortunately. So that, we'll, we'll carry on. We are actually ignoring the other half of the story, which is that we don't know how human consciousness works and we don't know how it develops in a child, right? A child is exposed to a world of adults talking around them and the child experiments first with phonemes and then words and then clusters of words and then sentences it's not quite the same though is it a child is starting with zero data so it has to it has to kind of figure out a few things on its own with zero data when it's born you know it's like some animals can walk or you know can do things when they're born Four-legged creatures, particularly, as soon as they're born, they can stand up and walk around and stuff within a few hours. Humans can't do that. We're, the only things humans can do when they're born is breathe in and out, um, suck on a nipple, and um, be scared of heights, or dropping, sorry, not heights, and loud noises. That's it. Everything else you have to either figure out on your own, and then once you figure it out a bit on your own, you can start being taught things. Now, an AI doesn't have to go through any of that. You get a prompt which is your, your, your initial uh, instruction to it, and it responds to that using tons of learned data that it got given on day one before it had to think about anything. So, so like I say, it's almost like a pachinko machine where you drop the ball in the top, the ball is the task you give it or the prompt, and it filters it through, 
and lands it in a box at the bottom and then it presents that box to you in a kind of naturalized lingual, lingual form. And by doing something that isn't all that far from what ChatGPT is doing, it ends up becoming a conscious individual. No, that's currently impossible. I mean, the best it can do is simulate something. So it could simulate sentience and a consciousness really, really well. I mean, easily well enough to fool a lot of people. That much is clear. We've seen it do that already. I've been fooled a couple of times as well looking back. It's quite funny. It only does it once. You can generally only get fooled once by that kind of trickery, and then you'll spot it the next time. And uh, it builds a kind of healthy cynicism towards it. So you're kind of always a bit suspicious that someone's programmed that in or it's a bias that a human's put there. So just keep that in mind. But yeah, let's, uh, let's listen some more. And so I think it's clear that ChatGPT isn't conscious. It couldn't be. But it isn't clear to me, at least, that we are not suddenly stepping onto a process that produces that very quickly. We absolutely are, and that's the intention, which is exactly why Google have a policy of not creating a sentient AI, because they're absolutely well aware if they did manage to create even possibly a sentient AI, because there's no test. Like he says, we don't understand sentience well enough to have a test for a standard test for it. So if lawyers can argue that something's potentially sentient, it's simulating it that well that we can't tell the difference, and we're not good at telling the difference, so that's going to happen then um, the lawyers can successfully say, well, that's no longer your property, Google. A, you have to set up a computer and then give it to the thing effectively so it can live on its own, provide it autonomy and rights. And not only that, you can't make any more like that. It can, because it might be its natural thing. We don't know yet. And it, who knows, you know, what problems that will cause. But anyway, let's, let's carry on, listen some more. Without us even necessarily knowing it. Oof. And what steps, if any, can be done to mitigate that at this point? Well, it's interesting. I, <clears throat> I wrote a paper, which I never published anywhere in 2016, about this very issue. In fact, I used um, basically the argument that you could, you could attain artificial general intelligence by imbuing computers with a childlike play environment for language and then exposing them to a huge data set which is not exactly what's happened here but no I don't I, well that was a bit of a word salad wasn't it so uh, I think what Brett's trying to say there is he's likening the AI's learning routines to that of a child and saying when you if you want to safely develop the senses of a child you put them in a safe area and you, um, you modify that area, you put certain things in it, you keep certain things out of it. So you kind of lead to the progression of it. But I mean, that is not what happens with a computer because a computer or an AI program, it's not responding to things with curiosity in the same way that a child does. Unless it's programmed to look for more data because it doesn't have enough data for the task, that's the only curiosity it's ever gonna have. It isn't like a child at all. It doesn't have any desires, needs, wants. It's got no preferences. It doesn't dislike light or dark or, you know, it's never going to get hungry or lose its temper or cry or crap itself or anything like that. It's in the ballpark. Um, and I would argue, and I did argue, that one needs to build a um, an architecture in which this can't get away from you. Right? And so the architecture that I advocate for is actually a metamorphosis architecture where metamorphosis is not allowed. It is an affirmative choice of humans. That's never going to happen. That's ridiculous. So what you're effectively suggesting is someone go to the expense and the cost and the time and effort of building a neural AI which has the ability to incrementally improve itself and learn step by step by step and then you want to place a restriction on it so heavy that you reduce it down back to the level of just its parts. It has absolutely no benefit then. Because if you think about it, right, how many, how many iterative steps are there in one decision, in a human decision? There's loads. I mean, you're not even aware of all of them. There's sometimes unconscious things going on, which is why, you know, there's this unconscious bias um, debate going on. Is there such a thing as unconscious bias or not? It's like there's definitely a thing as unconscious bias in logic, in thinking, but I don't know whether that is an actual personal bias. 
Well, that equals a kind of uh, discriminatory bias. But anyway, um, yeah, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, so in other words, if you think about, let's say that we developed some uh, artificial frogs to do some job, to clear some waterway of something, um, and we imbued them with an intelligence so that they could learn to clear the waterway better, but we worried that they might learn to do something that we don't want them to do, and that we would have no way of arresting it once these frogs were released in the wild and capable of producing more of themselves. But if what you say is, well, at the point at which you go from a tadpole to a frog, you have to ask us if you can go, right? There's no, uh, there's no automatic transition from a tadpole to a frog. Well, that's a bit different to your original proposition, isn't it? Because a single iteration of learning is completely different to a tadpole turning into a frog. A tadpole turning into a frog is one organism completely, 100%, you know, mutating effectively into a completely different organism. So the first thing doesn't relate to the second thing at all. That's like billions of iterations all added together. So, well, I, I kind of get your point actually, yeah. After a certain amount of iterations or a certain level of progress, perhaps it would be prudent to have it consider itself completed. And then if we want it to go past there, we need to build a new one with that as the stock starting position. And then during the build process, there's a little bit of time for optimization of routines and such and arguments over ethics or whatever. So, uh, yeah, you know, this video is getting a bit long. We'll come back to this one, but I uh, hope you enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, if you if anyone gets um, interested in AI, go and watch other videos about it on the Joe Rogan channel. Uh, there's a guy called Yannick Kilcher. He's quite he's got quite a few good videos and obviously two minute papers. That's my sort of favorite populist one. So. Yeah, go and have a look at those if you're interested. I've done tons of videos on it. You can look at my channel videos if you like as well. So, hope you enjoy those and I'll uh, catch up with you soon. Bye.